I'm Jim Check. You're watching Kelowna Now. We have again with us Stephen Johnson from Omnigents Asset Management. He's coming to us from Calgary, right downtown Calgary, where it's raining there. Yes, it is. Uh, how are you doing today in Calgary? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing ex really well. We have a, a sunnier day, kind of half cloudy, but uh, you you reached out and you talked about there's that the interest rates are starting to trend down. They're starting to take the uh, staircase down. And you're saying maybe that's not the best course for Canadians. Yeah, I mean, and if um, if you allow me to elaborate, um, if, like, let's just step back and say, like, Canada has some serious um, growth challenges, and what's what's driving those growth challenges? And at a high level, it's we have a very like very indebted economy, like one of the highest levels of debt in the developed world, only like second only behind Japan. We have very low investment in productive capital and the debt story doesn't actually tell the doesn't give you the whole picture because we've actually rates in Canada have been suppressed, kept low by the Bank of Canada for two decades since the, you know, the last 2008 financial crisis. And that has actually caused Canadians, at, you know, government, private, corporate borrowers to engage in what can only be described as an enormous bout of debt fueled consumption. And so what we have is we have an economy that's over levered, it's over levered and it's skewed towards consumption and it under invests in productive capital. And so the reason I make the observation that perhaps in the long term, pushing down, suppressing rates, um, the Bank of Canada is suppressing rates and pushing them down again, because without the Bank of Canada pushing down rates, they'd be much higher. Um, it's gonna delay that delevering process. And it's going to allow people to continue this debt fueled consumption binge that we've been on, which is damaging the, the capital structure of the economy. And so, although in the short term, it might feel good in the long term, actually, I think it's a negative because it's going to delay that day of reckoning. We have to delever. And of course, by pushing down rates, the Bank of Canada is allowing the federal government to continue to borrow, the provincial governments to continue to borrow. And it's actually just delaying dealing with that problem. I guess many Canadians would argue that they can't make their mortgage payments based on these higher rates, and and to them it's it's catastrophic, and 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 you know I guess they're not too worried about the debt of Canada in itself. But I, I understand what you're saying, but I mean to the to the average Canadian, when their mortgage, you know, it's up, it's basically fifteen dollars per per hundred thousand dollars, and then say if you have a million dollar mortgage, that's uh, that's an increase when they went a 19 fold increase, that's an increase of, you know, $2,900 a month. And many Canadians don't have an extra $2,900 a month. No, I mean, it's like, it's a terrible dilemma. Like it's, it's like, that's what I'm saying in the short term, of course, it's going to help everybody with their debt servicing. It's going to reduce the cost of servicing this debt. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I, ideally, although it's just not possible economically, is that you'd have, you know, the higher rates would land on, it's largely government borrowers who are over borrowing. Mm -hmm. um, and it would land on them and encourage them to, you know, pull in their spending and, and pull in their right. borrowing. But of course, there's no way to achieve that. So, yeah, no, I'm alive to that. I mean, I just, I guess it's what it's telling us is it's like Hobson's choice. There's yeah. just no good choice. So, yeah, so the, the interesting part is that the, the, the federal government has has had many opportunities to kind of pull back their spending and they've actually increased it and they've been told by the Bank of Canada that they're actually fueling inflation and all that stuff, but they continue to march forward. And, and an interesting development that just happened a minute ago, and I haven't had a chance to read it, but I think that the, the, the leader of the BC Conservative Party just put out a press release saying that he thanks Jagmeet Singh, I guess he put out a thing saying that he's he wants to axe the carbon tax as well. So it's kind of like, like the world is kind of a, Obviously, as polls are starting to show, people are making changes, but the, but the federal government has been spending way beyond its means. Yeah, and then that's that's not a recent development. I mean, if you look at the last thirty years, and in particular the last twenty years, it's we've just been consistently running fiscal deficits. Like every political party has done this, um, and you know, boring to fill the gap, and effectively, you're boring to consume, and you're just creating this problem because all. All borrowing to consume is pulling growth from the future into the present. I think I mentioned this last yep, time we spoke. Yeah, for sure. You can't do it indefinitely. Um, and so the day of reckoning comes, and that's higher rates, forced delevering, um, economic contraction, however it might manifest itself. 
And I think, unfortunately, Canada has kind of painted itself in a corner. And, and yeah, I mean, I'm, I have a mortgage just like everybody else, and I, I'd like the payments to be lower. But ultimately, we can't postpone dealing with those two big problems, the investment the, in productive capital and leverage. Do the Americans kind of get a pass on a lot of this stuff because their, their currency is like the world reserve currency and they can kind of export some of their inflation? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like that you describe it like that because that's exactly what they do, right? I mean, they run massive fiscal and current account deficits. Um, they issue basically effectively print the money issue bonds to fill those gaps. And then China is running a mercantilist policy to export to America. And they basically absorb those bonds. And so they absorb that excess U.S. you know, currency effectively. Um, and so they absorb U.S. inflation. But once again, like that, that can't continue forever. In the case of America, you make the correct point. It can continue longer than it can continue for Canada. Right. But do some of the, like, the politicians in Canada look at the United States and say, well, they're doing it. We should be able to do it. But they don't have that same luxury as, you know, like their world reserve currency because we're not a world reserve currency. I don't even think a lot of other countries even carry our currency. Even the Canadian government buys or sells debt in U.S denominations which is kind of an unusual yeah i mean uh when you have the luxury of being able to print the currency that everybody accepts for trade you can run this function like you can have dysfunctional behavior for a lot longer but ultimately even america has to fix its fiscal deficit and fix its current account deficit um it's just that that rec day of reckoning will be delayed much longer but you know once again we're talking about canada i mean for Canada, the problems are much more immediate and they just can't continue to be ignored, right? I mean, particularly given now that everybody's you know, laser focused on GDP per capita. Um, you know, they're talking about how the Canadian standard of living on a per person basis is deteriorating. Um, and a lot of people are scratching their heads and saying, you know, why? Um, and the why is really easy. We've, we've borrowed to consume, pulled all that growth forward. We can't continue to borrow to do that. And by focusing our economy at 70%, um, Seventy percent of the Canadian GDP is services, effectively consumption. Right? We've, we we don't invest in productive capital, um, and you know the like. I, I, I'm sorry, I may be repeating myself. I think I mentioned this last time. The bill has arrived, and there are no easy solutions, and there, there are no painless solutions. Yeah. For I mean, for the average person, it's basically like getting a bunch of credit cards living the life of a king for a, a few months and then all of a sudden you know like when they won't give you any more credit cards there's a bill due right that's kind of what you're saying is that all of a sudden yeah. there's a day of reckoning and you need to figure out what that is then yeah and it's like as if the credit card company said okay you're massively over over leveraged like you've borrowed right. far too much money rather than make you fix that problem we'll just reduce your interest rate so you can borrow some more Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody on this um, on this call knows that that isn't a solution for the long term. Right. So what does that do to our dollar, too, as well? You know, like if obviously if if we have massive debts and less people want to buy our debt, too, then and, and the dollar's trading around at 72, 73 cents. It kind of bounces around in there, right? 71 to 73. It's been range bound for a bit. Having like increased indebtedness. Will that, because I know there's some, um, one of the banks, and I'm sure if it was RBC or TD, came out and said that dollar could, if we continue on the same path, go as low as 50 cents to the USD. Absolutely. I mean, the Canadian dollar is a structurally weak currency, right? Fiscal deficit, current account deficit, net capital outflows, and low investment in productive capital. This is going to make your currency structurally weak. It just will. Um, and so that's a, that's a trend that could easily, you know, continue down to that level of course right people like people want to link, effectively people are if they're lending money to the government um right they're effectively saying what's the credit worthiness of this borrower well if you have a if you have a economy that's deteriorating then structurally you're not a good borrower right and and um and that's reflected in the foreign exchange rates right like the like capital leaves canada and, yeah, and so and if we end up with a dollar in the 50 cent range that inflation because a lot of stuff we're buying is, is based in U.S. dollars, including the commodities. And that would be, you know, the oil and all kinds of things is, is based in USD. That would drive inflation up uh, quite a bit higher, right? If you have a, you know, another 25 cents erosion on the, in the Canadian dollar. Yeah, I mean, the thing about 
I mean, historically, when currencies were linked to gold, you couldn't run a current account deficit forever because the gold flowed out and you ran out of gold, right? Um, and so if you think about it, as the Canadian dollar deteriorates and you make the exact correct point, we run this big current account deficit, we import all these goods, they'll become less affordable. I mean, that's the market's way of structurally fixing our current account deficit. Because if your currency is weak, you just can't continue to buy those things, right? Um, and I, I mean, I know it all sounds very gloomy. It's just that we've we've continued down this path and we've created problems now that just need to be fixed and fixing them isn't easy, right? So, you know, and it was one of the parts of our premise of for, for Cana the Canadian stagflation thesis is with a structurally weak cur currency, an economy that doesn't actually manufacture a lot of things, imports a lot of goods, you have this you have this really big setup for very protracted inflation, regardless of what the Bank of Canada does. The current government mood is, is there's not really um, tapping the resources or actually in a way suppressing resources, oil and gas and that and including mining and that. If there was a change in government or a change in in belief that we all of a sudden started to tap our resources and tap our oil and gas, could we not strengthen the Canadian dollar and make it a resource rich dollar? Of course. I mean, it should be a it should be a commodity linked currency. Right. I mean, of course yeah. it should. I mean, um, and like I would like like all this discussion about how to generate growth in Canada just ignores the obvious solution, yeah. which is just to get out of the way. Like one solution is clear. Get out of the way and allow uh, Canadian capital and foreign capital to exploit Canada's massive resource endowment. And of course, you would have a, you would have a strong currency. You, you right. You would have capital inflows. You would have growing GDP per capita, like all the good things that we're you know all the things we're saying. How do we solve this? The solution is sitting right there in front of us. Mm -hmm. For some reason, at all levels of government, we choose not choose not to pursue it. Yeah, it seems like we're actually doing the opposite. Even this this capital gains um, and raising the inclusion rate or, or decreasing or whatever is actually even driving even tech capital and, t and people out so that they leave to the United States, Silicon Valley and all those different things. And then we're kind of like um, pushing away oil and gas, LNG, mining, all those things that could make Canadians richer seems to be we're doing the opposite at the at the government level. Yeah, I, I would like to ask. Um, it's an interesting question to ask a politician because I know that this is their these are their beliefs. If you tax um cigarettes people smoke less you get less you know production of cigarettes if you tax alcohol you get less production of alcohol if you tax carbon you get less production of carbon if you tax capital higher common it's sense obvious. it's common obvious sense. Right? and yet they <laughs> yeah. will not accept that they'll accept one two and three but yeah. they will not accept that driving up the capital gains rate reduces the amount of capital available in canada and that's exactly our growth problem well, it's, it seems odd, too, that we import oil and gas from or oil from from, you know, the Middle East. And yet we suppress production of it here in Canada. And it, it, it seems kind of, you know, odd. Well, I mean, it does at like a superficial level and then underneath it, it's perhaps less odd um, because the, you know, the oil sands in particular have been a target of environmental activism for decades. And so, you know, they're relentlessly focused on con like circumscribing that production, even if it means importing, you know, similar oil from somewhere else that they, they, they're just focused on that asset base because it's in a developed market. Right. And if you can set the precedent there for restricting capital to that and you know, taxing it and all those other things, then you set the precedent for the developed world, actually. And so that's the reason that tactically there have been there's been a lot of focus on you know, Canadian domestic oil production. I think it's because it, it sets a political precedent for the developed world as far as environmental activism is concerned, right? So, so we're on a trajectory, which, which you say is, is, is not a great one. Like, it, it, like there's a day of reckoning coming. We don't seem to be doing anything or changing course to kind of utilize our resources or utilize, you know, even that capital gains inclusion. Would, would a change in, in policy help us deflect some of the, 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 the trajectory we're on? Of course. I, I mean, um, particularly the federal government has a really outsized influence on um, the capital markets in Canada, right? And the resource markets and the, the um, development of infrastructure and all those other things, right? 
Um, and so the government can, the federal government can choose to facilitate those things or it can choose to um, impede those things. Right? And, and sometimes choosing to impede them is intentional and sometimes choosing to impede them is just an unintentional consequence of you know, operating government. Right. But it's very clear to outside observers of the Canadian market that the Canadian market isn't a capital friendly destination. Yeah. You're an asset manager. The change in the capital tax rates or the, the inclusion rate, how much sorry. does, how much, I, is that coming sorry. from you? That's okay. Yeah. It's, it's all good. Um, how much is that affecting like people's like portfolio planning and, and what they're going to do right now in Canada? I don't know that, you know, these things are very slow moving, unfortunately. Um, uh, so I don't know about personal investment allocation decisions. And and in, in practice, you see this increase in the capital gains rates uh, being rolled out across the developed world. Like it's being discussed in America. It's being discussed in England. It's, be, it's being right. discussed in the EU. So I don't know that Canada's rates are going to be that different. Uh, the challenge is that it's just it sets the precedent that hmm, th this is a market in particular Canada where these rates are probably going to continue to go up. And so let's pick a market with less regulatory uncertainty and with lower lower cat with lower taxes. And outside the developed world, there are lots of places like that. And so, you know, when you're investing, you don't necessarily need to invest in, in the United States or the European Union. Um, you can find some places that have very low capital gains treatment. So, um, I mean, it, it's not magic. If you drive up the capital gains rate, if you drive up the tax on capital, capital will go elsewhere. It's just the case. Yeah, and I know, we, I know there, there, there's, an, there's an idea being floated in the United States on unrealized capital gains, which, you know, would, you know, like anybody that's sitting on large stock portfolios and they haven't, especially like, you know, like, founders and stuff like that that are sitting on you know tons of stock and they don't really sell it they just borrow on it and then they use that money and if they were to start taxing you know people like elon musk and mark zuckerberg based on their stock portfolios that would bring in i, I guess they look at it as you know billions and trillions of dollars at likely right but that would be scary for a lot of people too i think i mean gains on sorry taxes on unrealized gains have been tried before i believe they've tried it in france i think they've tried it in sweden um, you know, like limited test cases, they never work. Typically, first of all, you've got to, like, it's the seen and the unseen. You've got to say, okay, we have this theoretical, you know, these theoretical tax receipts we're going to get from this, but what's the impact on the economy and how will tax receipts be depressed somewhere else? And then, of course, people like that you mentioned have a lot of, like, uh, resources at their disposal. They can, they structure around these type of things. They invariably... The, the impact of these things, while they make good marketing and campaigning slogans, the invariable impact is that you have less capital flowing into the economy and the uh, ultra wealthy people who tend to restructure their lives. And so you don't tend to, to tend to get any of the proceeds that you were expecting. And then on a net net basis, you get less capital and your economy suffers. They're, they're really regressive taxes. Obviously. How do Canadians protect themselves from what you're saying? Like a stagflationary environment, if event rate states do have to go up to protect the dollar and to do different things, what what can Canadians do to protect themselves? It's stagflation is a very difficult environment um, in which to invest. But I mean, if you look at the 1970s, you can start to get a glimpse of first of all how interest rates trended. It's very interesting they went up, you know, inflation went up, rates went up, and then there was an, they sort of thought they had it um, defeated. There was a rapid rate cutting cycle, and then there was another enormous burst of inflation that lasted much longer. And so you can look at the 70s and say, okay, well, what things did well in the 70s? Because you had economic stack, like mediocre economic growth and really elevated volatile inflation. And not to advocate for things that we do, but like farmland was a, a really outstanding performer in the 1970s. Um, it really likes stagflation for the obvious reasons that people don't change how they eat. And so it hedges right. the recession and hedges the inflation. So hard well. assets like farmland, gold, I think, did really well. And gold is doing extremely well at this point, too. Yeah, I mean, gold is gold is a great barometer um, because gold now is finally starting to signal some of the challenges we have. And 
despite, you know, people in the markets are saying, well, inflation has been defeated and gold is saying, I don't think so. Um, and I would trust it as an indicator more than, you know, talking heads. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, you got to think, okay, what things hedge recessions and what thing, what things hedge inflation, you know, separate the two. Right. And so there are parts of the commodity sector that do extremely well. Gold does extremely well. You know, agricultural commodities tend to be fairly robust during those kind of periods. So, but what I would observe is that the things that you've done for the last 20 years, if we have stagflation, are unlikely to work because that was a period of low inflation, high growth. And so, what you can't do is, okay, if there's a risk of stagflation and it's material, I'll just continue to do what I've been doing. That is one thing that you should not do. Yeah, for the average person though that doesn't have large stock portfolios and the ability to invest in farmland or in your gold, and you know, like it's it's and if they have you know like those million dollar mortgages, this this can be really crippling for those people. So obviously that would mean supply would come on. Like I mean, there'd be more supply. Obviously that would drive house prices down, and you know, it actually even like kind of make the cycle even worse, wouldn't it? It does. Uh, Canada's created a real. Um, a real mess in residential real estate. It, it, it just, it's, it's amazing the, the, con, the set of conditions we've arrived at. So we have on a like, you know, uh, relative to income, we have one of the most expensive markets in the world. We use the most leverage in the world to buy houses. 40% of all Canada's fixed capital formation is residential real estate. So it's hard to see how houses continue to go up. And yet we still have a two and a half million home shortfall. Right. And that it, could have lots to do with the immigration cycle, though, too. Right. So it, it does. I mean, we've had rapid population growth. But to arrive at a point where you have these like we have this very overpriced real estate, it's very leveraged. Right. So it really is can't actually withstand high interest rates. And yet we somehow don't even seem to be building homes at these very high prices like is it's just, like you mm -hmm. think that like builders would step in and go this is a very profitable thing to engage right. in um i don't i don't know how we've managed well I, I do know how we've managed that it's a combination of you know uh we've suppressed interest rates for a very long time and we have you know very we have a lot of restrictions around building houses it's just the truth right and so um but you know that's a conundrum right because really in order to for people to buy homes they have to come down in price but yeah, that so means that people if if they made stephen johnson the finance minister tomorrow is there a plan that you would obviously being honest with canadians would help but is there a plan that you would if you had you know the power to make changes to to different policies in canada is there something you would do first of all that's not a job that anybody <laughs> same person would want but let's <laughs> I, I would say we need to step back and deal with first principles, right? So we need to deal with our leverage. We need to deal with our regulatory environment. We need to deal with the capital outflows in our country, right? And we need to deal with our chronic underinvestment in productive capital. And so we need to make Canada a more welcoming place to capital, both domestic capital and foreign capital. And that's regulatory tax rates, all those things. Um, we need to encourage delevering without detonating our economy. Um, I mean, those are the big picture items we need to take care of, right? We chronically underinvest and we over borrow to consume. So we need to discourage consumption. I mean, if you want a really, you know, sort of high level, you know, sort of extreme proposal is to raise taxes on consumption and reduce taxes on income and capital mm -hmm. so that, you know, people who want to consume, consume, you know, right. Was, but it encourages people to save and invest. Yeah, no, I, it, and, it, and I think that is the solution, right? And in, in, induce businesses to invest in capital, which in, in increases production, and then allow enough surpluses here so that we can sell some of that stuff somewhere else as well. And then, in, yeah. and then induce people to save some money. Um, I mean, that is seems like the you know like sometimes to politicians that's kind of counterproductive because. 
lowering tax rates actually will increase productivity and will actually increase the revenues that you take in. But it seems like they, they go for the easy answer and it's like increase tax rates because that's immediate because they don't believe because the other one takes time to happen, right? Because it's, it's not like companies can deploy tomorrow, right? You know, it's like saying you know, like whatever some Calgary office like West Jet wants, but 50 new planes in the market. They got to go build them. They got to do different things, but it takes time for that to happen. And sometimes maybe they're looking for the quick fix, but the quick fix tends to be maybe the, the addition to the problem. Yeah, I mean, they're looking for election cycle fixes, right? And we have a multi-decade problem here. Yeah. But I mean, cut the personal tax rates so people have more like uh, more savings. I mean, that's a first step, right? Yeah. And then reduce capital, like the tax on capital and the tax on gain. So they're encouraged to take their savings and invest in productive capital. And you could increase the GST rates on certain items to discourage consumption. I mean, it sounds very centrally planned, which I'm, I'm not a big advocate of. But I mean, a big influence on the Canadian economy is the tax system. And right now, I would suggest we have we t we tax income and capital too high, right? And we under tax consumption. So I think we should, and we need to dis we need to reduce consumption and increase investment. So clearly, the path forward is to reduce the taxes on capital and income for corporations and individuals and increase the taxes. And we have a, we have a consumption tax in Canada, it's GST, increase the, the taxes on consumption in order to start turning the economy in the other direction, focusing on investment rather than consumption. So we can look we can look to BC and Alberta for one area in, in forestry. Forestry is kind of in a shambles in, in British Columbia. We're, we're seeing closures of sawmills a lot where like job losses and we just had another big closure can't foreclose more mills well the and alberta their their industry is doing much better than than the british columbia industry and it has a lot to do with stumpage costs and that I, when i talk to some of the professionals in the industry yeah i uh, like i uh, it's it's funny like i I, used, I spent a lot of time working in europe and i have still have a lot of colleagues there and they're always they're always shocked that Canada isn't one of the richest places in the world. Shocked as an outside observer, because they like they would they always say, like if we had that natural endowment, we would be absolutely wealthy. Um, and this, it, it, this, we we have one of the best. If you want to consider us a ranch, we have probably one of the best ranches that's undeveloped, right? Like we have we have everything everywhere, and 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 the second largest land mass and. Uh, and, and rich in mining, rich in, in forestry, rich in oil and gas. And, and you know, it's, it's incredible what we have at our water, even, even clean water. And it's incredible yeah. how we seem embarrassed of our resource sector. I used to be a mine site controller as well. And I, I know all the stuff that we had to go through um, just to, you know, get the permit and do all those things. And it just seems to be just like hurdle after hurdle after hurdle. And instead of like, you know, like we could probably be, our, our citizens could be as rich as the people in Dubai where they, they spread the wealth out to the, the, you know, the citizens and that. And, you know, like we could do so much more in Canada if we would just to tap our resources. Of course we could. And I, I, there's this like, there's this, I think it's a, it's like an honest misconception or it's a willful misconception. Like there's this idea that, you know, we will, we will discourage all these activities in Canada because for whatever reasons, some of them are ecological and some of them are just philosophical or political. Um, and, but they'll just occur somewhere else because, you know, for every dollar of GDP that the world increases requires, requires resources as inputs. And yeah. so we're going to have 2 billion extra people. GDP continues to go up. All these resources are in demand. And so like us not developing them here, doesn't prevent them from being developed. And in fact, I would suggest that Canada has the best regulations, the best technology, like it's the best place to develop these things because it gets done responsibly. And yet you are right. We just either it's I, I don't understand the ethos, but we, we are definitely against the development of natural resources in Canada. Yeah, we, I mean, we, we have some of the like if I just take mining, for instance, we have some of the best miners in Canada. We have some of the best technology, like the people behind mining companies. 
just that they happen to be all mining somewhere else. Do you know what I mean? And it's not that we don't have the natural resources here. They just, they just, they end up in different countries because they can't get a mine going here and all the, and the money. And, and if you tour hospitals, you're going to see in there, you know, like this, this uh, you know, like donated by Kinross, this donated by, you know, I could go on and on and list all these things and what mining companies have done. And the, one of the big things is every community that is outside of like a major metropolitan center, has been started because of resource company. People don't go start at, you know, like in Fort St. John to do, you know, I mean, they, they're in Fort St. John because of oil and gas. They're in Fort St. John because of forestry. They're in, they're in high level Alberta because of forestry or, or oil and gas. The, these communities are based on resources. And I think like, especially in British Columbia, those areas are, are treated like second rate citizens. And, and, and part of the problem is, I, I talked to one of the you know, executives with a, a, a large lumber mill. He's saying that a lot of people in Vancouver think that every tree is like a, a tree in Stanley Park and they don't want those cut down, but they don't realize that there's working forests. And if we don't manage the forest, we're going to have more wildfire problems and all that kind of stuff. So we need to actively manage our forests. And if we look to Finland and, and some of the Scandinavian countries that manage their forests, they have very little wildfire problems. Yeah, yeah. it's... It gets it gets back to a central issue. I just think that Canada, like you know, there was a period of probably forty or fifty, sixty years where all the infrastructure in Canada and this enormous capital base was accumulated on the back of developing all this this re natural resource endowment, and then the economy started to you know switch from production and you know manufacturing and all those sort of you know I would argue concrete industries. And over the last 30 years has switched to consumption. And there's this mis, there's this like misplaced idea that somehow you don't need to do these things, that you can have an economy that's, you know, 70 percent consumption and, you know, it's 70 percent services, very little manufacturing and production. And you will have that economy will generate a sustainable standard of living for its citizens. It will not. It will not. Right. It may for a short period of time. And you, the way you do that is what we've seen. You borrow to consume um, and borrowing is just like consumption is the destruction of capital. Like, if, you know, it's the verb to consume means to destroy. And so when you're, when your economy is skewed to consumption, you're just consuming your capital. Right. Yeah. And so we built all this capital on the back of this endowment and all this productivity and this investment, and we've just been consuming it. And, you know, eventually your standard of living, it's, it, it will be compromised and it, we're seeing it. And I and also, you know, like we, if we look at Canada again, second largest land mass in the world, and basically we truck goods from coast to coast, from the from the seaports to the others, you know what I mean? And, and, and the carbon tax, and they say it's only, you know, like it's basically at the gas pump, but the carbon tax is on everything we do because we ship almost everything either by truck, train or, or you know, like our, our tractors in the field. It's, it's such a massive input on most of everything we do like everything we kind of produce and or even to get it from you know like the port of vancouver to edmonton like you got to truck it or, or train it there right and that's all run on diesel yeah well i mean if you think about it um economic growth is predicated on like net real energy like inexpensive net energy and I mean, unambiguously, as GDP goes up, energy consumption increases like without net common energy, sense. Yeah. yeah. Like you don't have economic growth. I mean, it's like that is an unambiguous statement. Um, and so, you know, when you drive up the real cost of energy in the economy, you like, first of all, you damage the capital structure because there are certain businesses that have very thin margins and they can't afford to absorb that increase. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is it, it's a massive cost. Like, like I think in Canada, um, energy is about six or seven percent of GDP. Well, if you increase its price by, you know, in totality by make it go from seven to eight or seven to nine, that takes two percent of GDP off. Well, that's your yeah. growth. Yeah. Like, and then that's, most that's, most people don't even realize if you if you happen to be a, a, per, a receiver and a, and you're seeing the bills from these trucking companies, it's right on there as an extra bill. Not even like you know what I mean. They've added it as like you know you've got your regular shipping costs, and then they've added carbon tax right on the bottom. You can clearly see that it's affecting 
everything we do, right? Like, you know, and I use this analogy for a lot of people, like you think of a slice of bread and how simple that seems, right? But it's a tractor that kind of plants that seed and a tractor that harvests it. And then they put it in a truck and take it to the granary. And then a train takes it to the mill and they use uh, energy to grind it. And then they ship it to a flower place and then they make bread with energy. And then you drive to the store and pick it up. Look at all the energy that goes into just a slice of bread. Yeah, it's like, you know, there's been tons of research on this. And, you know, for every like as you drive up the cost of energy in the economy, your your growth rates decline. And Canada needs that growth rate because we have we, you know, we were we have rapid population growth and we also have this underinvestment in capital. And so then to then on top of those, you know, uh, conditions to overlay an increasing real cost of energy. It's like, you know, the, the problems keep mounting here. I mean, like, it's very clear, right? Um, if you look back into other periods of time, like post-war, when the, like the like energy as a percentage of GDP, effectively its cost was much, much lower, like three, four percent. You had much higher growth rates because, you know, you had excess net energy and it was inexpensive. Um, and so what we're doing right now is we're repl- like, and you know, not to upset some people who might be listening, but the things that are being added to the grid are not low cost energy providers. They're, they're not. Um, they may be environmentally sensible, but we can't, you cannot say that they're low cost. And so we're effectively increasing the cost of our energy supply at a time when Canada can least afford it. Yeah. It's over it's a double. It's a double-edged sword for Canada. I mean, we it's great that we're the largest land ma- second largest land mass and country in the world, but it's also a challenge when we have to ship goods from for people into the, you know the other areas, right? It's 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 a bigger cost than you know like if you're Germany, obviously your transport costs, you have, you know, like more trains and more different things and your shipping costs are not nearly what they are in in Canada. And then to add, a, you know, a punitive carbon tax to everything like in shipping and that it's just it's ridiculous. Even if you if you modified and said the carbon tax is just at a gas pump for people's consumption, as opposed to putting it on on you know the transport of goods. I mean, it seems kind of a little um, silly, right? Because that's really punishing consumers. I mean, I think what it, like you know, as a society, we decide what we want to prioritize, and if we want to prioritize greening the electrical grid, that's fine. That's a like that's a consensus decision, and we do it. But what needs to be done is an honest discussion of the consequences so that we can make an informed decision. And what people need to know is other markets that have done this have seen a, like doubling, tripling, quadrupling of energy of electrical energy prices. Um, and that is a consequence for manufacturing and as a consequence for individual standards of living. Um, and so while it's you know fine if that's if we want to do that that's fine. But we need to have a, we need to have I think a, an open and honest discussion about what it will mean to our standard of living. Um, And so we're doing one without the other. I think if people understood both, they'd be, well, for sure, they'd be more informed and perhaps they would decide differently. Um, Yeah, I think Canadians need this, this, uh, like, dose of cold water uh, that you're providing here Um, because I think a lot of times we get get kind of like a one-sided view from economists and telling us how we, you know, stay the course and, and do all these things, but we don't look at the consequences like you just said. There's some consequences to our actions that are, are beyond some of the things that they're telling us. Like there is real world consequences where people are having a tough time putting food on the table, paying their mortgage payments and, and, and putting gas in their car, and even affording cars right now. I mean, the lots are starting to fill up with vehicles that aren't selling. Yeah, I mean, it's the West has a very high standard of living. And if collectively the West wants to achieve these decarbonization goals, and that seems to be the consensus, then politicians need to have an open and honest discussion about what it will mean. And that's what we're lacking. And I think that's a shame, I think, um, because I, I, like I said, I think people need to make informed political decisions. Um, I, I, yeah, we, we had, we arrived at this point last time. It's like, there's just a lot of challenges. Um, and I think that there's a lot of political decisions being made absent really comprehensive economic analysis, because like, I'll give you another example. Um, Bank of America put up this enormous research report and they said the cost in the West to getting to net zero is a hundred trillion dollars, 
by 20, I think it was 2050. Um, so in 30 years. So that's three to $4 trillion a year um, in total costs. They said it was effectively unfundable. Like it was unfundable, you know, there, were, there wasn't that much capital to fund that. So right. they assumed it would be largely fund, or if it was only half funded, by government programs and government printing money and issuing bonds, it would increase inflation 3% per annum for 30 years. So instead of 2% inflation, you'd have 5% inflation. That was their baseline prediction. Right. Now, that needs to be discussed because if we want to do that, we need to know what the consequences are. And if it isn't funded through inflation, inflation is just a tax, you know, another source of capital, yeah. then it's going, to, it's going to require, you know, that capital and, 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 to be pulled out of the rest of the economy and it's going to strand all those other assets which is also a recessionary force like when you take all this productive infrastructure and shut it down prematurely and go you know to to convert into other sources of energy and other processes that those are write-offs and that's a recessionary pressure and so you know once again i don't like when i hear the discussion particularly in the political arena it, it really exists in a vacuum without any economic analysis. Like mm -hmm. even, you know, we're talking about the carbon tax and it, it has an impact on consumers. It does. Um, but it's much, it's a much bigger issue than that. And the bigger issue is never discussed. Like what are the long-term GDP growth consequences for making this transition and doing these things and not developing our resources. And it, it just never takes place. And, and I'm not blaming any political party. None of them talk about it. Right. Well, I mean, we could talk all day. We've been going at it for almost 50 minutes and I don't want to take too much of your time. You're very generous with your time. And we should, maybe we should do a monthly check-in and see where we're heading in this trajectory because it's, right. it's, it's, um, I know a lot of Canadians are hurting and that's, and that's, that's showing up in the polls. They're very dissatisfied with where they're at. Right. And I talk to a lot of people and a lot of people are having a tough time making their, their mortgage payments, their rent payments, and, and then the grocery store and all those things. The Canadians are definitely in a place that they haven't been for a long time. Yeah, it's 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 a travesty, particularly when you look at what Canada is and what Canada could be. And to be in this situation takes, to, I mean, I forget who said it, but it takes monumentally bad management. And yeah, we're like asset rich. Like can, Canadians are, are effectively like one of the most asset rich countries in the world like i'm absolutely most asset rich countries in the world i mean i would i would challenge people to say which is better and yet we don't want to utilize those assets and again that comes from my background being a mindset controller and and knowing how hard it is to do things yet everybody wants what goes into a cell phone like you know everybody wants their iphone and then that cell phone is copper lead zinc silver silica gold I mean, yep. it's lithium, like everything is in that phone and all of that comes out of the ground and it's all powered by energy. Every bit of it is powered by energy. You charge that phone yep. every day. Yeah. The modern economy is absolutely resource intensive. And to ignore that fact is it, it, it's just you're a Luddite. Like the yeah. modern economy yeah. is resource intensive. It is. Yeah, it's, it's not it's, the opposite. It's ludicrous. And then with what's going on with the Ukraine war, Basically, with the BRICS nation, we've almost cut the world in half as far as commodities, and Canada sits in the catbird seat in that in that realm where we could where we could supply Western Europe and all that. You know what I mean? And and instead, you know, they, they ask us for LNG and we offer them hydrogen, which is you know years away from being you know a developed product or ever. Um, and and it seems like silly. Yeah, I mean, hydrogen is another interesting topic, which we should discuss one day. The physics of hydrogen, like there's there's fundamental physical laws that make hydrogen a very poor mm -hmm. energy. Yeah, you and source. I could have a good discussion on that. I used I, I had invested in Ballard Technologies in the past and I've and I've sold that investment. And you can look at the stock chart and you can come up with your own uh, uh, conclusion as to where that's at. Yeah, I mean, it's not an energy source, it's an energy conduit, obviously, um, with very, very challenging physical properties. It, yeah. Anyway, yeah. It's, it's a technical yeah. discussion. Well, you know, this has been great. We've had two great conversations, so let's let's do it again. And, uh, you know, I, I think having the reality that you bring to the, the table, I think, from what we're seeing from a lot of other places is, is what Canadians need to hear. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know that I'm correct, and I'm sorry that it sounds gloomy, but I think collectively we've 
Canada's you know, all countries are go through difficult times. It's not like these are insoluble mm-hmm. problems. They're just challenging problems. That's right. Well, I mean, if we if we put we Canada Canadians are resilient. That's for sure, right? We've shown that time and time again in challenges, and 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 hopefully we find that resilience and the motivation and the, I guess the the conviction to find a better solution. Yep, yeah, yeah. we will. Uh, and I thank you for your time again, Stephen. And uh, thank you. Enjoy the enjoy the Calgary weather. You got a little bit of rain there. I guess that's cooling off down there right now. But um, yeah. Calgary's a beautiful city. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. And I'm obviously happy to come back anytime you have me back. All right. Thanks a lot, Stephen. And uh, thank, thank you. you for watching Kelowna Now.